All right, I think we can start. We can start now. So um, it's uh, we are lucky today to host uh, Hao Zhu, um, assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Hao Zhu, she received her bachelor degrees a degree from Tsinghua University and master and PhD degrees from University of Minnesota. Uh, and she then been a postdoctorate research associate uh, and then assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at uh, University of Illinois, Illinois of Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on developing innovative algorithmic solutions for learning and optimization problems in future energy systems. Her current research interests include physics-aware and risk-aware machine learning for power systems and the design of energy management system under the cyber-physical coupling. Uh, Hao Zhu is a recipient of numerous uh, uh, awards, including NSF Career Award. She was in, uh, invited attendee of the US NAE Frontier of Engineering Symposium, and she is a faculty advisor for three best student paper awards at the North American Power Symposium. We also uh, known Hao Zhu as the associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Smart Grids, and she's also a member of Power Energy Society long range planning uh, committee. So uh, welcome, how do you thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is yours. It's just a quick, a quick reminder to everyone, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and how we'll address them whenever it's convenient for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vlad, um, uh, for the nice introduction, also for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to speak at the uh, In Optimal uh, webinar series, and uh, it's really wonderful to have uh, these online webinar series to connect to colleagues uh, in the in this time of uh, isolation. So yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be here and talk about our research on machine learning for power system operations. Uh, I would like to thank my students. I think uh, one of them, Xiaohui, is here, uh, but uh, students from my group and also NSF and other funding agency for support. Um, so uh, we have witnessed a blast of uh, a artificial intelligence and machine learning um, in all uh, variety of uh, disciplines, uh, but also um, increasingly in operating power systems, as you can see from these news reports. Um, so this is thanks to uh, unprecedented opportunities that we have in operating power grades, uh, thanks to all these increasing metering and sensing infrastructure that we have today. So as uh, here, the question remains that how we can possibly harness the power of machine learning to tackle pro uh, problem-specific challenges, as uh, particularly for real-time uh, power system operations. Because uh, all these uh, learning tools, um, they use uh, offline training to find a very powerful uh, mapping model, and then using them for real-time decision making is very uh, attractive. So for this, uh, I will briefly uh, um, visit three problems that we are looking at in my group, uh, uh, focusing on the first two problems. Uh, one uh, is on the topology of well learning for real-time market prediction, where we use the topology information of the grid to simplify the model of uh, neural network uh, and also simplify the computation for achieving these uh, uh, topology-dependent neural networks. So this is the physics-informed part of uh, neural network design. The second problem is more on um, using these uh, neural networks in real time, and in particular in a decentralized environment. How can we assure that these uh, neural network models are risk well, specifically uh, with regard to the problem of coordinating uh, distributed energy resources at grid edge? How can we um, uh, maintain um, uh, satisfactory performance with respect to voltage uh, deviation risk? So the last problem is more recent results that we still are working on it. It is related to uh, emergency response. How can we uh, empower these uh, neural networks so we can achieve scalable uh, emergency, uh, fast emergency response under extreme uh, weather events? So without further ado, I will uh, jump start uh, on the first problem and probably stop uh, uh, after I finish the first part if there are any uh, questions. 
Okay, so we, uh, I hope that we all have seen the um, famous uh, or powerful op uh, optimal powerful problem. So it's a very uh, well known optimization problem in power systems. And currently we solve it as uh, using uh, all, there exists a variety of uh, powerful OPF solvers. And then the current uh, implementation architecture is that, oh, if I have the input of the system operating conditions and I use that to to config the OPF solver, and then we can pick any uh, our our favorite OPF solver, and then use the output um, uh, to do the uh, system dispatch. So when the uh, uh, operating condition of the grid changes, we obtain a variety of input uh, to run this OPF, uh, OPF solver. Uh, now the question comes that if we uh, whether we can use offline neural network training to uh, construct this input to output mapping. So in the online implementation phase, we can directly um, use the input of the system operating condition to determine um, very efficiently on what is the best system uh, dispatch uh, decisions. So um, the, the gist of this approach here is that if we use the real-time uh, uh, computation of the neural networks, uh, when they are trained offline, they can very well map this uh, input-output relationship here. So there exists a variety of uh, approaches consider this uh, learning for OPF uh, in a, a framework, um, such as those identifying active constraints or use it uh, to warm start AC OPF solution, which is well known and non-convex and uh, complicated uh, optimization problem. Um, recent work has also connected to like uncertainty considerations in stochastic OPF and also the duality analysis of convex OPF. So our focus here is to exploit the grid topology information so that the neural network models for, uh, for this uh, OPF input output mapping can be greatly simplified. Okay, so a little bit more on the OPF problem. So if we model the uh, uh, power network as a graph with n number of nodes and uh, uh, the number uh, the set of lines in this set E here, uh, if we consider the general AC OPF problem, it uh, as we know aims to reduce the um, um, the total generation cost while satisfying a bunch of operating conditions associated with power flow balance and voltage limits and the resource limits, the PQ at every node, and also the last one is the line flow limits here for each uh, IJ, which is a transmission line. So um, if we think about the input output mapping, um, the input here would be uh, all the nodal limits here for PQ and also uh, the sufficient uh, coefficients we need to describe this uh, um, uh, generation cost function CI. So uh, usually CI is a piecewise linear or quadratic function, so we can take the uh, corresponding coefficients and uh, put it into this uh, vector xi here, which, uh, um, which holds for every node i. Um, in terms of the output side, we know we want to predict the dispatch decision in terms of PQ. Okay, so this is a very genetic uh, OPF model. It, it can think of uh, as generation, flexible generation here that can also have flexible load demand. And if the nodes do not have any flexible resources, we can simply set the uh, PQ limits to be uh, zero here. So this is uh, a gen genetic formulation. And as we can see on the input size, the number of inputs scale with the number of nodes n, and similarly for the number of uh, output also scales with number of nodes n. So if we use a genetic fully connected neural network, FCNN here, its complexities uh, or the number of parameters per layer will scale quadratically with number of nodes. And that could be a big concern for larger systems with tens of thousands of nodes. So uh, in the past, people have said, oh, yeah, uh, since the uh, network itself is a graph, we can use graph learning technique to predict the PQ. But here comes a challenge. The PQ dispatch solution does not follow any dependency on the topology itself. It is mainly driven by, say, the generation cost considerations. So it's not a good idea to use a graph learning approach to predict PQ.
Here comes our idea. Instead of predicting the PQ, we advocate to predict the locational marginal price, LMP, which does, uh, um, arises from uh, casting the dual uh, problem for the uh, OPF uh, uh, formulation. So let's consider the simplified ACOPF, where we similarly have the power uh, balance constraint and also the rear power limits because uh, we uh, drop the reactive power here and also the land flow limit. So by introducing the multipliers for the uh, power balance constraint and also land flow uh, limit constraints here, we can uh, 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 we can construct this uh, LMP vector pi, which has dimension m, m by one as well, um, that is associated with the optimal lambda uh, and mu multipliers. Specifically, it's mainly driven by the mu, which are only non-zero at uh, congested lines, so um, associated with this S matrix um, that is uh, commonly known as injection shift uh, factor matrix, but is uh, very uh, strongly dependent on the topology and specifically the graph Laplace and BR here. So, um, uh, well, as a well-known uh, future for LMP is that it is very uh, uh, strongly dependent on the graph topology and also the uh, location of the congested lines. So we can uh, see that from a real-world uh, LMP map. This is from the ERCOT system, and also this is from the uh, California ISO system, where you see there this locality property uh, is clearly observed for the LMP, real-time uh, real LMP at these two uh, 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 ISOs. And uh, specifically, uh, they share very similar uh, LMP pattern when um, we're looking at two locations that, uh, that are very close to each other. So in Texas, it's usually a high congestion in um, these uh, Dallas, Houston, and Austin areas. And in California, it's mostly in the Bay areas, as you can see the high price here. So uh, we were going to use this graph neural network to pre predict LMP and to uh, 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 go over a little bit on the graph neural network GN architecture, we formed the input future, uh, which had the P, uh, PQ limits and also uh, the cost constraint, uh, cost uh, coefficients into a N by D vector. Mm -hmm. So N is the number of the nodes. Um, so every layer of the GNN involves two filters. One is denoted by W here, which is a graph filter. So it has a very a special stru structure that it only has non-zero entries when um, IJ uh, is, uh, uh, is a transmission line. So there's a lot of sparse uh, or zero entries in W for real-world uh, system. In addition, there is also a future uh, filter H that intends to uh, uh, map the input uh, future, uh, the uh, D futures here into a higher dimensional space in order to utilize the nonlinear functional mapping capability of neural networks. So the major uh, computational saving comes from the sparse structure of W here. Uh, one thing we know that in real-world power systems, the number of transmission lines scales uh, with the number of nodes is usually like two or three uh, times the number of nodes in the uh, system. Therefore, with this uh, uh, sparse connectivity, we know that every layer of the GNN would only have the number of parameters in the order of n plus uh, d squared, uh, where n, again, is the number of um, uh, nodes in the system, and d is the, uh, the, future, uh, map, uh, the future space mapping, which is usually very small compared to the number of nodes. So this is a great saving compared to the original FCNN, which is the quadratic uh, relation there. Um, so we have implemented this approach uh, in our recent uh, uh, conference paper here, and uh, we follow this intuition from past work on predicting LMP, but then it was mostly using uh, tools like a, a support vector machine this, uh, that is very difficult to uh, construct a, a nonlinear mapping in general. 
So we uh, use the GNN to predict LMP, and then um, from the input future X uh, matrix here, uh, we want to predict this n by one vector of LMP vector here. And based on the LMP or this new variable, we know that we can also immediately form the optimal dispatch solution and accordingly the line flow here. So in terms of loss function design, uh, we can definitely use the mean square arrow for the LMP prediction itself. Um, uh, we can also incorporate some feasibility regularization because we know that land flow limit is a very important uh, uh, constraint in a real world uh, system. So we can try to uh, introduce a regularization term associated with the total land flow limit violation. So we didn't uh, do too much on this uh, uh, land flow leave violation because this is the still a centralized framework. If there's any possible violation in real time, we can run the uh, we can use that to warm stat, uh, like say the AC OPF uh, solver again, and, and to improve on this land flow uh, limit uh, um, uh, satisfaction. Um, but then it will become a, a, a huge issue when we move to a decentralized framework in part two. Okay, so here are some results. So we uh, we, we uh, implement the method on 118 system uh, for using AC OPF and also a 2000 bus system with DC OPF. So what we are plotting here is respectively for these two systems, the corresponding uh, normalized uh, LMP prediction arrow. Um, so uh, uh, we compare the proposed GNN with the original fully connected FCNN. We also compare it with um, another uh, uh, high complexity uh, neural network, which is called uh, graph informed uh, DNN, uh, which has the same complexity as FCNN as well, but it also incorporates a little bit of graph information. So from the um, uh, normalized uh, um, um, LMP prediction error site, you can see that uh, um, the GNN proposed performance is incomparable to the other fully connected neural network. Uh, we, uh, for each of the method, we also implemented, uh, uh, we also compared the original MSE loss function and also the feasibility regularized uh, loss function here. Um, so definitely uh, when we have the feasibility regularized the, uh, the prediction performance can be further improved. So in terms of um, um, the uh, prediction for LMP, it doesn't seem to be different uh, among these methods. But when we move to consider the performance of land flow limit violation, um, it turns out that because of the uh, simplified uh, uh, model design of GNN, it doesn't seem to run into the issue of overfitting or overparameterization. And therefore, when we use GNN with feasibility uh, regularization, it has a superior uh, performance compared to other uh, um, other uh, methods for the larger system here. So when the system size grows, uh, grows um, the issue of all parameterization will be more severe. Well, this is where we see GNN has better uh, land flow limit uh, uh, satisfaction performance. Um, well, of course, the biggest uh, advantage of GNN is the simplified model uh, architecture, uh, where we see here the net total number of parameters uh, between uh, among GNN and the, the, the other uh, two um, fully connected neural networks uh, varies uh, very significantly. Um, uh, it is order of magnitude reduction in terms of uh, number of uh, uh, parameters. So we also use the GNN for directly classifying the contrasted lines. And this intuition follows from the uh, original topology dependency as well, uh, because the contrasted line locations can also uh, depend very strongly on the graph topology. So uh, to do a classification task, we pick uh, the top 10 contrasted lines and uh, use the cross entropy loss, which is a, a popular classification uh, problem metric. Uh, 
So what we are showing here in the figure, uh, the recall uh, and also F1 score metrics. As we know, recall is the true positive rate and F1 score is the balance between recall and the precision metrics. So again, we see that for uh, larger systems here, um, GN is better in maintaining um, this, uh, um, uh, this classification results, uh, while the other uh, fully connected neural networks, because of uh, the size and dimensionality issue, um, its performance drops very, uh, very quickly uh, when we go from uh, this larger 2000 system. So this is uh, the same results here uh, as in the figure, where well, you can probably see uh, more clearly that uh, uh, GNN has um, uh, closer uh, to this uh, between, for the larger system, GNN maintains the performance as in the small one. Well, the, um, the other uh, uh, solutions have uh, uh, over parameterization issue, which, uh, led, which led to um, performance degradation. Um, so the last part uh, for the GNN work is something we are still actively exploring now. We have very good uh, numerical results on that, our understanding on that. Um, it is, comes from the fact uh, uh, sometimes in power network, the topology of the network can vary. So when we train like a fully connected network that is um, that's Ignat, uh, that doesn't depend on the topology information. Whenever the topology varies, we might need to retrain the, uh, the uh, neural network model again. However, for the uh, GNN and, um, uh, model, since it's uh, depending on the topology, it can quickly adapt to the new topology if, say, there is some kind of uh, line outage contingency somewhere in the system. So what we have observed is that if I start with original nominal topology, okay, and I train the GNN on the original uh, LMP mapping, I use this new uh, nominal mapping uh, for a, a certain line contingency. And uh, so here, different colors correspond to different line contingency. It's interesting to say to see that um, this original nominal mapping still can fit the new topology pretty well. So what we are pretty, uh, um, uh, what we are plotting here is the distribution of the sample error value. So for certain topology changes, it might have much larger uh, error, but then for most of the topology variations, the LMP mapping still stays pretty constant. And the more interestingly, if we use this uh, pre-trained uh, GNN from the nominal topology and then uh, and use just a few samples from the new topology that uh, we, um, we have under each uh, contingency scenario, um, it takes a very short time for this uh, pre-trained nominal GNN to adapt to this new topology. So, uh, we usually only need three to five IPOC, and then the, GN, uh, the um, uh, this uh, improved uh, GNN training can uh, quickly adapt to the new topology with the same uh, precision as in the nominal case. So we are, uh, this is related to a transfer learning uh, capability of GNN, and very interestingly, it helps for this. Uh, um, uh, uh, LMP prediction problem from what we uh, suspect that is the uh, congestion pattern usually in the power system is very constant. So it might not change significantly when there are certain line contingency, uh, especially for those lines that are not congested originally. So this allows us to quickly adapt the uh, LMP prediction uh, to the new topology that we may have. So with that, I, I, um, I think uh, it's a good time to stop for the, if there's any question for the first part. Uh, yes, please feel, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask your questions. Maybe I can just uh, start quickly. Um, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm puzzled how, uh, on one of the slides you put the uh, loss function formulation to learn mm -hmm. LMPs where you include criterion of uh, uh, floor feasibility, right? right. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, how do you um, make this transition from uh, predicted price to floor uh, in this uh, training process? 
Uh, do you have some closed form solution for flows as a function of price or like what do you use here? Yeah, yeah, great point. So um, it's much easier for DC OPF with the linear and power flow solution. So from price, we know that uh, um, uh, simply uh, the generation dispatch will become comparing its own uh, cost function CI with the, its local pi i, and then depending on the limits of PI and then deciding on this P uh, uh, solution here. So from the duality analysis. Um, so uh, from price, uh, sorry, from P, the uh, generation dispatch to the flow limit under uh, AC, uh, 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 sorry, DC OPF, it is a linear transformation uh, based on the injection shift factor. So we also did that for AC OPF. Um, on the price part, it's still the same. Uh, sorry, on the <laughs> sorry on the dispatch part, the mapping from price to dispatch is still the same, but then we only consider the real power using mm -hmm. as if it is the DC uh, approximation. So there is uh, some gap there. We still need to uh, look a little bit further. So That's actually, like incorporating the Q would also be important in this uh, um, mapping here. Yeah. Impressive. Thank you. I had another question on this formulation. Um, so here you kind of mentioned that um, the the line flow violations are, um, well, in the formulation, it would be a soft loss within your training. And then if there's any violations in real time, you would kind of defer to uh, OPF to, to deal with that dispatch. Um, right. And so I'm wondering if you're thinking about um, other formulations, so uh, constraint, like hard constraint satisfaction within your ML framework. I think there's a little bit of work that is being done in that space, both in ML and also in OPF style work. So just wondering if your lab was looking into that. Yeah, a uh, great point. So, um, so you mean that it's possible to directly constrain this uh, blue part, the violation part, to be satisfied um, exactly during the training process, right? Yeah. So, I think some of the different methods that I have seen is either um, uh, learning to satisfy that constraint within training or kind of post-processing of the of the output to ensure that it matches. I guess it's a little different because you are looking at the LMP um, rather than the uh, specifically like the power flow dispatch, for example. But I was just curious mm -hmm. to see your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have not come across specifically that type of work. Uh, it'd be great if I can follow up with you to get the, the references on that. So there, you're right that we are looking at LMP, but then there is still a connection from uh, between LMP. So it's one-to-one -one mapping between LMP and then the P uh, prediction. So it will definitely be possible if uh, we also use the similar technique, um, like from the P prediction to, uh, uh, to make, maintain the uh, line flow limit. Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, point, uh, bringing that up. I have a question. You're, you're solving essentially a linear problem. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're, you're solving a linear problem here, right? So. so yeah, the DC they solve plus. fairly fast. So, what's it? Have you looked at how fast the linear program solves versus versus your uh, machine learning technique? Yeah, good point. So we do have uh, the DC OPF part, which is the uh, linear program. So. Um, I, the offline training definitely would take some time, but then with the uh, the graph um, uh, neural network, uh, it's improving over traditional neural network. So the offline training definitely would be uh, slow, but then the online solution uh, is usually very fast for neural network. So uh, we also have uh, like um, solution or validation on AC OPF type of solution, um, and uh, yeah, we still like we cannot compare uh, compete with a um, like AC OPF solver if we only look at say the offline training time. But then the online implementation is usually well um, the real time computation time uh, saving comes from. What what what's how what's the size of the saving? I mean, how much 
how much savings do you get? Or how much faster does this, this the um, machine learning solve than just solving an OP? So the real-time prediction is is uh, uh, essentially uh, like a linear uh, uh, linear computation. So it's like sub millisecond in general in uh, in real-time prediction. And and the LP solving what kind? I mean, so, these are not these are not really big problems. So you would suspect that the LP was solved fairly quickly, also. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess um, LP, uh, um, sorry, LP complexity is also polynomial um, in uh, in uh, the real time uh, computation. But oftentimes it's much faster. Yeah. So um, I agree with you that uh, I guess um, when you say that if we are gonna solve for like a DC OPF problem. Um, it's already very efficient, so it might not have too much uh, uh, computation advantage when we do uh, when we use one of these neural network models. Um, I think uh, uh, most of the learning for OPF uh, problem stems from um, uh, like the possibility of accelerating AC OPF in real time computation, and also uh, trying to. Uh, have a quickly uh, a adaptability to a certain uh, kind of system vari uh, variation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so uh, if there are no other questions, I will start on part two, uh, which is where we have recently thought about how to address like the operational constraint limits problem. Um, so this is used for distribution grids. Um, as we witness more and more distributed energy resources at grid edge, and the coordination of them is an important issue uh, for uh, utilizing them to support grid operations. So one big challenge in distribution system is the lack of real-time communications. So you can see from uh, this plot here, so uh, unlike a transmission system where a control center has direct links and also frequent information exchange with remote meters, but in distribution systems, um, uh, the infrastructure of communication is by and large uh, very, uh, uh, very weak. So, uh, how to coordinate these resources at uh, at the uh, um, at limited communication um, is a very important problem. So usually there could be some infrequent broadca broadcast from the control center or like a substation automation system, but then there, these are not frequent enough to know what's going on at the individual DERs or at the, uh, at the grid edge uh, nodes. So. Um, People have thought about the same ideas of using learning for OPF to addressing this uh, uh, DR coordination problem. And uh, their recent works on a constructor uh, like kernel SVM and also uh, reinforcement learning type of methods. Still, by and large, um, these works did not uh, specifically look into these possible network constraints and also uh, how to maintain the limits when there are, um, uh, how to maintain this uh, network limits violation. So there are like, uh, there is possibility of doing heuristic projection or like what we have seen earlier, like this penalizing the violation, but it's still not like uh, guaranteed performance. So what we want to look at is how to address this statistic risks or when um, we, especially when we use a decentralized uh, neural network, when these neural uh, network models are in implemented at individual nodes, how can we maintain that the overall system uh, grid operation limits are satisfied? So um, this problem uh, of coordinating uh, DER uh, is very similar to OPF, is specifically uh, looking at the reactive power from each uh, uh, DER resources. 
So the objective here can be the losses, the total losses in the system, and where the constraint here, uh, um, the voltage limits constraints. So we are choosing the Q uh, from the uh, the uh, resources uh, under the uh, available uh, lo uh, limit denoted by this set Q here, um, such that the voltage at each location is uh, within the limit uh, V bar and V underlie here. So note that Y here stands for the input future that we have seen in the OPF problem. So it is related to the um, uh, feeder operating condition, while uh, the other um, uh, part, the X matrix is related to the uh, network uh, admittances. So um, if we have the Y in a centralized location, uh, then we can similarly solve in this problem as a quadratic pro pro uh, programming problem, because uh, losses actually is quadratic in the racket power input Q. Um, even if we want to consider like multi-phase uh, system, we can also use this kind of uh, uh, linearization. So uh, a convex, uh, it becomes a convex problem. However, as I mentioned, uh, uh, this problem is uh, primarily uh, challenged by uh, how to obtain this uh, solution in a centralized fashion. If I don't have the why uh, in real time at a centralized control center, and then it pre uh, prevents me from solving it effectively um, at a centralized location. So uh, here comes the learning idea as well, uh, which has been explored in other early work as uh, mentioned earlier. So the goal is there to uh, um, uh, construct this mapping from the operating condition Y, which are basically the network-wide uh, measurements everywhere in the system to uh, the optimal solution of reactive power Z. So phi here stands for the parameters for the neural network. So uh, a simple idea to construct a scale, uh, uh, to do a decentralized uh, uh, control, uh, or, uh, decentralized design is to have this neural network to be scalable. Um, specifically, um, each uh, prediction will only use, uh, utilize the local YN here at node N to um, map to the local prediction on ZN here. So uh, essentially, we are decouple this overall prediction model into one at Pernod's, and this will make it very uh, effective to construct a scalable um, uh, DER uh, operation or decisions. So um, to do that, we can similarly use GNN, like essentially asking all the nodes to have the same future features. Um, uh, but and this is not something that uh, uh, we are primarily considering. What we are um, very concerned is that when after I train this individual neural network model, the scalable one for each node, and um, when since there are infrequent communication between the control center of the distributed nodes or resources, then these nodes will implement this neural network on, uh, in online setting without any coordination. And this uh, will make the issue of constraint violation, specifically the voltage limit violation, very um, of high concern because we don't know that when the uh, individual nodes are implementing this neural network, how much it would affect um, uh, the voltage in the system without frequent communication uh, be uh, between those uh, distributed resources and the centralized location. So uh, this is exactly the problem if we use, say, the traditional loss design, the average loss as mean square arrows. So here, the K is the sample index. Uh, traditionally, uh, if we only look at the performance of predicting the Q solution, which is denoted by Z here, the loss function uh, is uh, averaged over all the samples on the individual loss for each sample, um, each sample K. So uh, this average loss uh, represents the prediction performance on average, but it's not able to capture the worst case scenario. What can be uh, used is uh, this well-known risk measure called a conditional value at risk, or CWA, which um, 
is to say that if I give you a threshold alpha here, so we set it on the total number of samples, uh, 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 the top alpha k number of samples out of the total samples here, and these represents the worst case prediction performance, and the c y is going to be the average among these top alpha k samples. So C Y can be sort of as a balance between the average uh, operation among the samples and specifically uh, uh, that with the only the worst case uh, scenarios here. So what we uh, propose is to regularize the original uh, MSCE prediction loss F here with this C Y risk alpha uh, gamma. Gamma is the threshold. And the regularization parameter can be uh, tuned uh, through cross validation. Um, but uh, specifically, it turns out that uh, we might not gain too much by looking at the worst case uh, performance of predicting Q, as Q is usually very. Uh, very uh, straightforward to predict. However, if we consider the worst case of uh, the voltage limits uh, violation prediction, then that uh, the CY for that uh, uh, the worst case uh, 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 voltage limit violation uh, by incorporating the CY uh, uh, risk measure for them uh, will be very helpful. So we will see that later in the simulation. But specifically, uh, we have addressed the issue with CY in terms of computation. Um, we know that CY loss is usually used very popularly in uh, uh, robust optimization because it's preserving the convexity of the loss function. However, the neural network model is typically non-convex. I'm oh, sorry, missing something here. Uh, but recently, people have seen that um, neural network model satisfies the so-called PL condition, and uh, therefore CY also satisfies uh, PL. So that's more of like a theoretic analysis uh, in terms of recent development. But specifically, if we want to train or optimize the CY risk, it, it incurs a learning efficiency issue. Because as we have seen, uh, the CY uh, gamma uh, alpha here only uh, involves the worst case samples. And also, in particular, modern uh, machine learning tools usually do not optimize uh, every in every epoch, optimize every um, the full uh, sub, uh, full set of samples. Instead, it uses like a sampling method to draw randomly from the full set of samples um, um, to form a, a surrogate of the gradient methods. So these sampling based approach together with the uh, fact that CY only depends on worst case samples will make that the total number of samples that we use to compute uh, the CY gradient very limited. So um, is that's why we have this learning efficiency issue. So we propose something, uh, uh, a straightforward approach, um, which is selecting uh, in every uh, updates with um, use a simple selection scheme uh, for like a mini mini batch based method so mini batch draws a subset of the total samples here and uh, we um, consider the CY risk for that mini batch and compare it with a threshold if it is much lower than that threshold it implies that this mini batch does not have too many samples uh, worst case samples and then we can disregard them uh, for the gradient computation so it's a simple uh, selection approach, but it's shown to be helpful for the training process, as shown here. Um, so we have uh, IEEE 123 bus system with just uh, six D nodes, and uh, the first uh, uh, one here is trying to predict the Q solution. And um, so uh, we specifically set up the DRs to have limited uh, information on its local uh, uh, measurements or some selected feedback information and use that only to predict the optimal QN solution for itself. So we compare the loss function of the original MSE here and uh, the, the CY regularized the loss function uh, of specifically the CY for Q um, prediction here. And then we also implemented the proposed algorithm of mini batch selection as this algorithm one here. 
So interestingly, because the Q uh, depends highly, uh, the optimal Q solution depends very strongly on the local measurements. It does not seem that uh, using the CVA for uh, a Q prediction has led to uh, any significant difference in terms of error performance here, which means that if we use the MSE um, loss metric, it is already pretty accurate in predicting uh, the optimal QN uh, for every node N. However, what we have witnessed is some computational improvement. It seems that this regularization term can still help the, um, the training process to avoid some undesirable solution. And then uh, we observe some com total computational time saving uh, with, uh, with this uh, regularization term. Um, in particular, um, if we use this mini batch selection, we uh, uh, reduces the average uh, epoch computation time um, for um, for the uh, regularized uh, CVA regularized uh, or the risk of well learning objective. Um, so as I mentioned, the best uh, performance comes when we have when we introduce the CVA for the uh, voltage limit uh, violation. Um, so from what you can see here, uh, if I only use the MSE, and this is the distribution of the voltage deviation in per unit. So usually uh, 0.05 is the point where we um, think that the violation is too high. Um, so if I use the original MSE arrow, um, you can see that it tends to track like the optimal QG, but then the optimal QG still has this violation issue, most likely from the mismatch of model because we use the linearized um, linearized uh, approximation of the distribution power flow here. So after adding the CVA risk for the voltage deviation here. Uh, in both the blue and the green line, uh, it can effectively reduce this worst case uh, voltage violation. Actually, here it was able to reduce it to be uh, to be below the uh, 0.05 uh, uh, violation limits. So also when we try to um, when we use the, the mini batch selection, the proposed algorithm one, we can see that um, it was able to um, reduce the computation time for the training process and also has compared to the original uh, CIVA without selection step, uh, the average IPOC computation time is also reduced. So um, the uh, claim here that we have is that it's able, the CVA based risk a well uh, learning loss function was able to address um, the risk with the limit, uh, um, the voltage limit violation, and also the, um, the mini batch selection idea is effective in terms of uh, uh, improving the computational efficiency. So, um, and with that, I would just quickly go over the last part that we are still working on, and it's very preliminary. And it comes with the same idea of using uh, learning to accelerate decision making uh, in power systems, particularly with emergency responses uh, during grid um, restoration process. So we have seen uh, more uh, uh, extreme events in power systems uh, or in extreme events affecting the resiliency of power systems. And this is coupled with the fact that we have more and more variable energy resources that uh, together uh, that um, reduces the stability guarantee of uh, the grid. So um, great uh, emergency responses is becoming um, more and more uh, important. And uh, the type of tools that we can use includes like load shedding, uh, topology optimization, and this kind of uh, flexible uh, control in power system. So the question here is that how we can possibly uh, attend these solutions in a scalable fashion. So here comes the same learning idea. So traditionally, it is a centralized computation framework. Say that we have a small system illustration here, and then if there are certain failures due to the extreme weather events, so the system goes to an emergency uh, condition. 
And currently, the optimal load shedding is computed in a way that all these uh, um, uh, condi uh, emergency condition are uh, communicated to the com uh, compu uh, control center together with any uh, changes in the system operating condition. And the control center using this solution to, uh, to find the optimal load shedding, for example, and then send it back to the load centers and then they will implement it. Um, so we think that the same ideas of learning for this solution uh, for this decision making process that have been used for OPF and also DER coordination can be used similarly here. So say that when this uh, contingency happens, uh, each node already knows a certain kind of um, a variation of system operating conditions because the power flow would uh, is. Uh, is coupling every node in this uh, interconnected system. So, so when this lens goes to outage, um, it will induce different line flow patterns. It will ha uh, changes the voltage and po sometimes possibly frequency and definitely like line flow um, uh, patterns around this uh, load center. So uh, without uh, uh, waiting for the control center to tell this a load center how much you should reduce the um, uh, the, the load demand um, the node itself can use this offline training uh, idea like uh, train a, a neural network in the offline to know that oh if this is the line flow pattern then I should reduce uh, the load demand in this amount so uh, it, uh, it, uh, here comes the opportunity to uh, uh, use the neural network training uh, results to accelerate this uh, load shedding process, the decision making time for this uh, load shedding um, process. Uh, we are still uh, exploring the same, uh, this idea, but uh, um, yeah, there, uh, uh, there are some uh, great results that we have seen so far in uh, doing this scalable load shedding. And so hopefully to come back uh, next time to talk more about that. Uh, with that, I think it's uh, time for me to summarize the talk. So um, uh, we have um, looked at um, different problems on using um, machine learning to uh, uh, um, for the for the um, optimization based decision making process in the grid um, for uh, the OPF problem we have seen how to incorporate uh, topology information to accelerate the training process and also adapt to any online variability of the system uh, topology condition um, we have seen that we can use risk measures such as uh, conditional value at risk to improve the decentralized uh, DER coordination, specifically improve uh, reducing the risk of uh, voltage violation that can be um, uh, that results from this decentralized uh, neural networks. And that last part is something that we're working on. Um, to try to address uh, the scalability of the emergency load shedding decision making. So there are some different future directions that we are actively uh, pursuing for these uh, directions. And uh, we hope um, uh, maybe to talk a little bit more next time. Um, so in general, I think there are different opportunities for adapting uh, machine learning tools for these fast decision-making problems in uh, grid operations with respect to like a resource, uh, uh, the resiliency of the grid, or sometimes um, when the resources have some dynamic uh, uh, property, well, we know that uh, reinforcement learning is usually uh, very powerful for uh, this type of problem. And uh, in addition, we have witnessed more and more um, new type of uh, electronics interface that are inverter based resources where they uh, they introduce challenges like lack of modeling information and where we know that a data driven approach is usually very powerful to attack uh, to tackle this uh, uh, lack of modeling information. So with that, uh, uh, this is end for my talk and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Hao, very much. So uh, I think we have time for a few questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself.
and ask your questions. Well, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. This is super interesting. Um, could you talk a little bit about the locality property that is needed for, or, or that's um, used for the LMP prediction? And is that a gen is that kind of a general uh, requirement for GNN to have an advantage? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so um, so GNN um, by simplifying um, the model architecture in GNN specifically is to say that the the mapping um, in from the input future would affect most like the local nodes. So yeah, maybe this figure will be uh, helpful here. So because of this W matrix design, so any input futures at node uh, uh, I here would more significantly affect its neighborhood. So that's uh, essentially where uh, GNN can be very helpful to predict like um, the output futures that follow this locality issue. So that is definitely something that GNN prediction is more mm -hmm. powerful at. So, um, uh, so we connect that to the LMP prediction, which follows that property. But we know that in general, like um, the the PQ, uh, which uh, the optimal dispatch at the generator, does not necessarily share this uh, uh, this graph based uh, similarity. Meaning that a generator at um, at a location is outputting a uh, is uh, has a high dispatch solution. That does not mean that the generator next to it would also um, be caught into high dispatch um, because the these generators may have different cost functions, which makes one more attractive and the other one less attractive. But LMP for these locations should, well, if they're close, these two locations are close, should be similar. So, so that's what we are capitalizing on here. I see. Thank you. Uh, we have a two raised hands. So Arnav, please uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Yeah, hi. First off, thank you so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. In particularly, I was going to ask a question about the emergency response section for grid resilience. And one thing that I was thinking about is, have you thought about or um, have any ideas on either predictions or guarantees of kind of aggregate load shedding being a reasonable number with this decentralized option, because I could see the case being where if a if decentralized nodes are all making the decision on their own and they all decide to do just too little load shedding, it ends up with the system still being in an inoperable state. And I was just wondering if you had been thinking about how to maybe include guarantees of optimal aggregate um, load shedding. Yeah, yeah, great point. Yeah, so uh, we, um, this is definitely, there are going to be a lot of uh, um, uh, more investigations on this uh, decentralized scheme, because uh, exactly as you said, it has the same challenge as the decentralized DR coordination. How do we guarantee that these nodes, when they are making their own decisions, will collectively uh, be uh, constructive or like uh, satisfy what the system needs? So um, I, I think similar ideas as what we have seen in the DR coordination part can apply. And I'm very interested to uh, read more on what uh, Rabat uh, mentioned earlier, uh, uh, like also guarantee is uh, performance at the training phase uh, uh, exactly, well, with exact uh, guarantees. So I think uh, this is a, a great point that how can we try to uh, uh, steer uh, the uh, prediction results away from any of the worst uh, scenario that we really don't want uh, the system to run into. So like also ideas like um, we should probably try to penalize any uh, or like focus on scenarios that are more the ones, but then not focus so much on like, okay, predicting it when the reduction level is small, but focus more on predicting uh, the value when the low shedding amount is uh, very significant, for example. So I think a lot of uh, uh, these ideas could apply to address that. And uh, we'll be happy to chat more on if uh, uh, there are uh, suggestions or comments on how to improve on that too. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, next question from Rabab. Please feel free to unmute yourself. 
Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. I really like it. Um, I think my question was kind of going along the line of what Arna was thinking as well. Um, but I was curious to see why you are choosing um, kind of within the work that you're doing, like fully decentralized instead of um, including some communication links and maybe like a hybrid decentralized distributed approach. Um, so wh why fully decentralized in the problems you're looking at? Yeah, good point. So um, I think it's more on the um, um, on the light latency of the communications, uh, or um, from what we have seen, like um, the uh, whenever we need to upload information to control center and wait it to come back, it's usually like it's at the minutes level. But uh, uh, by collecting like measurements locally, we can definitely move the decision making to seconds level. So I think the hybrid design is a very interesting idea. So it might be that um, uh, say that uh, before the um, waiting for the control center to uh, provide this guidance, it, the, the load center can already start in some gradual process of load shedding. So it can be more dynamic and adaptive yeah, I think that that's a that's a great idea. We haven't I haven't thought about that. Yeah, thanks for yeah bringing it up again. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think that's where we can uh, stop for today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Hao, for join for your amazing talk, and uh, the rest of you for joining us today. So we will uh, get back to this uh, seminar series in two weeks. So. And then until then, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice Thanksgiving break, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.